Well, if you would, please, would you stand up real quick, give a big Harvest Church welcome to my dear friend, Reverend Jeff Taylor. Hallelujah. Do you love the Lord? Isn't he good? Hallelujah. Turn to somebody and say, wow, you look good after I pray. Hallelujah. Go ahead, tell somebody, you really look good after prayer. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Man, it is good to be back at Harvest Mobile. Hallelujah. I, uh, I, I, I don't have a uh, sob story to tell you for, I know that several people, you know, I'm, I empathize with people that have had a tough year, but uh, living under the blessing of the Lord, uh, <laughs> it pays. <laughs> um, I didn't tell the first service, but I, I wanted you to know that uh, uh, the Lord's been so good to me. Um, I, uh, years and years ago, we uh, heard from the Lord and we uh, made, we, we took a step of faith. It was a lot of, how many understand that a step of faith usually means there's a risk involved? (laughs) Because you don't know, you know the person that told you, but you don't know what all he had in mind. And so, uh, so this year, uh, we, uh, we sold two properties uh, two rental properties, and we bought five more. <laughs> Don't look jealous. Just, just, just help me praise the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> I've been saying, I, I've been saying for a number of years that the, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow. I've been saying that over my life. And then the Lord said, oh, I want you to get more specific about what you're saying. And again, listen real carefully. I love the Lord more than I love anything else. I'm going to just clarify. I love the Lord more than I love money. I love the Lord more than I love uh, my own wife. I love my wife with all of my heart. I love my children. I love, I really love my grandchildren. (laughs) You want to see some pictures? (laughs) Uh, I have five grandchildren now. We went from three to five. You know, five seems to be a number in 2021 for some reason. But we went, we went from three to five grandkids. And uh, amazing. But I, I, got some, I got specific with the Lord, and I began, he began to challenge me to say exactly what I'm believing him for. And so in 2019, I started saying some very specific things to myself and to the Lord. Not for anybody else's, not for it. But how many understand it is God that gives you the power to obtain wealth? Is that not what the scripture says? How many remember this one scripture that it says that he takes pleasure in the prosperity? Prosperity is not a curse word. Did you know that? It's not a cuss word. If you get in some churches, prosperity is a cuss word. That's a negative thing. But I found out that the opposite of prosperity is a cuss word. Actually, it's a curse word. You don't want to be under the curse. Now, what will really help us this morning is if you know, you know me, you've been around me, we're, we're family, right? We're, we're good. Uh, I've been here before. And, and when I'm talking or asking a question, I need some response. So it'll, be, it'll go a lot easier if you just nod at least, amen in some points, or just say, good for you. You know, that'll help. Because what I'll think is, is you're not getting it, and then I'll circle the wagons again, and then we could be circling the wagons until the Church of God in Christ get to the restaurant. (laughs) And if you've ever been in that church, it could be a long time. I preach in the Church of God in Christ, I preach in some Baptist churches, and they always get out right at 12. We're not Baptists this morning. Uh, but I do want you to know that the, the blessing of the Lord has been good. And this year, if the word of the Lord from my, f- that, that the Lord spoke to my friend is any indication, man, <laughs> if it's going to be better, yeah. woo! Right. well, you don't understand. I've been through, but you don't understand how good he really is. So um, I do have a word from the Lord, but before we get into that, I, I want to just let you know I brought some material with me uh, because this is the only time if I, if I was speaking in another service, I'd take more time to uh, talk about what's on the table. But there's a lot of material back there. This is an example of one of them. This is not a cassette. Yeah. 
Now we know how old you are. <laughs> this is actually USB, and if you don't know how these work, ask your grandchildren. They'd be glad to help you. <clears throat> and here's the deal. I can get more information on this than I can in... Uh, we don't offer as much CDs because you can't even buy a new car with a CD player in that. Some of you need a new car, it looks like. Amen. You, can't get, you can't get a CD player. So we, stopped, we had to adjust. So I had cassettes. We offered messages on cassette. Then we upgraded to CDs, and now we've had to evolve into USBs. And what this particular uh, series is, there's, there's several other subjects out there, but this one particular, just want to let you know, this one's called Discover Your Identity to unlock your destiny. You can't unlock where you're going until you find out who you are. And there is in our society today as, belie- as, as Americans, as people alive in this generation right now, there is a identity crisis going on. Everybody is locking on to whatever they think. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I was born. You know, I, what, what. They are making their appetites yeah. their identity. No, it's an appetite. I'm vegan. Were you born that way? Was that, is that your DNA? Is your DNA, you know, do that? No. How many understand that we, we are, when you're born again, you're regenerated? Yeah, that's good. I like that. So all things have passed away. All things have become new. And all things are of God. So if you find out who God made you to be, then you can find out where he's going to send you to, whom he's going to send you to, and what you're supposed to do when you get there. Does that make sense? Because the deal is, is that destiny, Moses didn't find out where he was sent to until he found out who he was. He thought he was Egyptian, but he found out he wasn't. He found, and that made him a deliverer. Jesus found out who he was by searching the scripture. And when he found out who he was by searching the scripture, he had a very clear awareness of his father and what his father's business was. And he stayed in the family business. And he did exactly what the family wanted him to do. And he, he purchased the price. He did what he's supposed to do. So this will help you how to, now what you go to, what you use as a measuring tool for your discovering your identity is going to be the determining factor of where your destiny is. Your education does not determine your destiny. Education was never developed to give you gifts, to give you talents. Education was designed to refine talents and gifts. If you remember a guy by the name of Michael Jackson, anybody remember him? Some of you, are, yeah. <laughs> Got a witness on the front row. Uh, how many understand that Michael Jackson, uh, there was one, one place that uh, they, they came out with his yearly earnings. He made $120 million in one year. Not standing any bread lines soon. So the deal is, but you know what? He did not go to school to obtain what he got. He was gifted that way. God has gifted you certain ways for your destiny. And it's your gift that makes room for you. It'll open doors that cannot be opened. It'll shut doors that need to be shut. So if you want to understand that, here's, here's one of the helps to get that to you. Anybody interested in discovering your identity? All right. Now, the deal is, is I'm going to throw this, but I am Harvest Church is not responsible for the actions of said guest minister. Here you go. I got it there. It had a little bit of a hook on it, but yeah, my, my golf, golf swing, my drive. Um, I want to share with you, I want you to take out a, uh, a, a, something you could take a note, notes with, or if you, if you want to listen to this later, it would behoove you to take some notes here, because here's one of the things that I kind of get frustrated with, with preachers around the new year 
is that, uh, first of all, there are some preachers that they only hear God in rhyme. And two, being the end of this year, 2022, ooh, it's got a lot of rhyming words that go with it. And so you hear a lot of, now I'm, I am making fun of preachers. Yeah. But the deal is, is that God doesn't always speak in rhyme. Sometimes he speaks real plain. And, and so if you hear a preacher saying, breakthrough in 92, or 2002. Hmm. <laughs> breakthrough in 22. Well, you know what? Breakthrough could have happened in 21 too. Yeah. Also. <laughs> But the deal is, is that there, there, God does have plans and purposes concerning when we begin to seek, take time to seek him and about what he wants to do in the days ahead. And I don't always have a, a annual word. As a matter of fact, I would like to see more preachers have to give an account in November and the early December for what they said in January. I mean, if everybody else is going to be accountable, why can't we be accountable for what we said, you know, at the end of the year for what we said at the beginning of the year? Does that make sense? So I don't typically, I don't position myself that way, but I do want to hear from the Lord. And I do believe I have a word for you. I do believe I have a word for this church because I've been asked, I've been invited, and I've been given a position to say so. And this, and I didn't really get this, I didn't get this months ago, I just got this a few weeks ago. Matter of fact, the, when uh, Pastor Kevin asked me to minister, uh, and it just kind of, I started saying, oh Lord, what do you want to say? And this is the way I approach all my meetings, is Lord, what do you want to say to this group? What is it? I've got 1,800 sermons in my collection. I've got, I, I got a lot of stuff to say, obviously. <laughs> But the deal is, is that you don't need a word, you need the word. And I'm not interested in just having nice things to visit, nice truths to talk about. Lord, what are you saying to us at a timely word? What is this word in season? And this is what the word of the Lord came to me for you. All right? So uh, he, said, he said, 2022 will contain unprecedented opportunities for advancement. 2022 will contain unprecedented opportunities. In other words, the opportunities that you're going to have will be of a certain kind or likeness that you've never seen before for advancement. It will, be an, uh, it will contain unprecedented opportunities for advancement. Your marriage has unpre- it will have unprecedented opportunities for a better marriage, advancement in your marriage, and advancement in your health. Some of you, this 2022 will be the year of wholeness. Yeah. Rather than going from healing to healing to healing and needing a miracle to miracle to miracle, you will just live in wholeness, soundness. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just, I don't want to be at the mercy of the next healing. I'd like to live healthy. Isn't that better? I don't want to live sound. So you have, there will be unprecedented opportunities for advancement and spectacular distractions to forfeit what God has in store. There will be unprecedented opportunities for advancement and spectacular distractions to forfeit what God has in store. In other words, whatever you keep looking at the longest will probably be what the outcome is. So you have, 2022 will have unprecedented opportunities for advancement in various areas of your life, but it will also contain spectacular distractions for you to bite on that will forfeit what God has in store for you. In other words, you're going to have to be people of faith. (laughs) Is that any news? (laughs) No. 
Because the just shall live by faith, all right? So 1 Corinthians chapter, I don't want you to turn to 1 Corinthians, but I would like for you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, because it is a sermon, and it'd be nice to quote the Bible at, at some point in a sermon, right? So, but 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, you know, I, I as a wise master builder laid a foundation. Um, anybody interested, how, how many have actually been involved in the construction industry of, of any sort? Anybody in the construction industry? One, two, three four over here. Okay. My father was a roofing contractor and growing up that we, we did a lot of roof. My, my, I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, if you want to know my real testimony, I was born on a Thursday. I was in a Pentecostal church the next Sunday. That's, that's the entirety of me, my whole, that's, that's my whole testimony. I was, I'm a church baby, church, a, pew ki- uh, a pew baby, a church kid. I grew up in church. Doesn't mean I was perfect. Just means all my sins were done in church. I don't know what you all are laughing about. <laughs> Get a word of knowledge about what you did, you know. No, but the, but the interesting thing is, is that the, the, the church taught us a lot of things. And, and one of the things in, go, in being involved in roofing, and we were at there, but a lot of times my father did new construction, but then there was also re-roofs on older houses. But one of the things about new construction that you found out about is you, you, you really became acquainted with the importance of foundation, the importance of a, a solid or a firm foundation. That the entire structure that went up on that foundation actually rested or reached back to the foundation for strength. So regardless of how high your building goes, your house goes, in times of adversity, in times of storm, in times when there's wind or there's times, all of that, at the very top of that, it will reach back down to its foundation for strength in times of adversity. But that's the way the Christian life is. Regardless of how successful you become, you have to reach back to foundational principles for st- to, to, main st- to maintain stability. Stability is only as good as your foundation. And if you didn't have the proper foundation coming in, you have to establish that foundation at some point if you're going to build a successful or strong life on that. Does that make sense? So there are some principles that must be laid as a foundation that must precede various things. There are first principles. One of the things that we're going to talk about today is one of those things that absolutely goes at rock bottom, the very rock, the bedrock of that before you actually pour cement on that, you have to have a, 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 a layer in which you can lay this foundation on. We're going to talk about something because, guys, if you're going to have unprecedented opportunities for advancement as well as spectacular distractions to forfeit, then you're going to need to know, be able to recognize what is a distraction and what is an opportunity for advancement. Because how many know those things can be very vastly different, right? So, but if you if if we will do the first this first principle, this bedrock principle, we'll be able to recognize. Now, all I'm doing is giving the slowest person time to find First Peter chapter five. <laughs> You'll find it right after First Peter chapter four. If that doesn't help you, then look on your neighbor. All right. If, all right. So, so the deal is is uh, here in. Um, in chapter 5, verse 5, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about this, start in verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. You don't hear much talk about this anymore, do we? No. Uh, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes. All of you be submissive to one another. Oh, here we're going to talk about submission. No, we're not talking about submission. But it says here the next far, this next phrase, and be clothed with humility. So if you need a, if your homiletically minded cannot endure a sermon without a sermon title, just entitled this message, clothed with humility. It says, be clothed with humility. Why? Because there's some benefits here. God resists the proud. One, He gives grace to the humble. Verse six. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Verse 7, 
casting all of your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. It's interesting because humility is one of those things you have to have in place before faith. You have to have humility in place before walking in love, before the authority of the believer. As a matter of fact, you have to have humility before you can even get saved. You have to have humility before you can get saved. It's, it's the very bedrock of things. And it's interesting because he, you can, now this whole passage where, where Peter is addressing, he's talking, he's addressing an audience of Christians. He's addressing an audience of believers. He's talking to believers and he's saying, guys, I want you to be clothed with humility. He's saying, I want you to submit yourselves to one another. I want you to, the, the younger to submit to the elders. He said, he said but, but be clothed with humility. Now, all of you that are humble, stand up. Anybody that's humble, stand up. Oh, it's a better response than the first one. Uh, all of you that are humble, stand up. Oh, looky here. Some of, you, some of you are just standing because you think, oh, I, I'm going to get a treat, you know. No, no, no stay standing. Stay standing. Because listen, the world teaches you that if you're standing about being humble, you're really not being that humble. The, that's what the world says. You can be seated. Thank you. The world says if you're standing about how humble you are, you're not really that humble. But that's the world's definition. And for some of you that couldn't stand or wouldn't stand, it's because maybe the world has defined humility without the Bible. See, as a Bible teacher, definitions are very important to me. I, there, are, there are subjects that I stay away from because I can't, I can't define it well enough in order to pass it on to others. Until I, do, uh, until I get a grasp of what the definition of it is, what, what are the parameters of it, what, how far it extends, how, how, is it, how pragmatic can I use it, I can't, I can't actually teach on it, I can't minister on it unless I have a clear understanding of what it is first. Now, humility, because the world has done so much communicating about what humility actually is, we can't stand sometimes. We can't stand because we, th we think, well, you, you can't draw any attention. But if the Bible says be clothed with humility, do you think that I, if I put this jacket on, do you think I know if I have the jacket on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Humility, you either know you have it or you don't know what it is. You either are clothed with it and you know it because you check the mirror. Yeah. The word is the mirror. You check the mirror and you know either you have humility clothed, you have the cloth on or you don't have the cloth on. Now here's my point. There are four, there are four promises. Well, this verse tells me, let's, before we get to that, there are, there are, he's addressing Christians. Didn't I tell you that? He's addressing Christians. And then he says this. He said, be clothed with humility. Why does he have to tell Christians to be clothed with humility? Because some Christians may not be clothed with humility. Because either you're, either you're clothed with humility or you are in pride. There's no in between. Right? Nod to help me. Otherwise, we're circling the wagon. We don't want to travel the... You're either, you're either in humility, clothed with humility, or you're clothed with pride. There's no, there's, there's no middle ground here. So we could, and so when he says be clothed with humility, he's actually addressing some Christians that may not be clothed with humility. And then he says, this is why, because God resists who? He resists the who? He resists the proud. Now, guys, if I have, you know there are things that are resisting you, right? You know the, de the devil is resisting you? 
Did you know the world is resisting you? Did you know that your flesh, your unrenewed mind is resisting you? Listen, I don't need God on that side helping that team. I don't want the devil and God and my flesh and the world teaming up to resist me. But if I'm proud in an area, if I'm proud, I not only have to deal with the devil and, uh, and all this other stuff, I got God actually resisting. Do you know that there are people that I have found that God was resisting them? God was resisting them because of their pride. I don't want to be in that. I don't want to be that in that ever. I sure don't want to be in that going forward. But now, the Bible says here, there are, there are four promises that are attached to this being clothed with humility. I want you to notice this. Notice this. He says, he says here in uh, verse number six or verse number five, he said, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Everybody say grace. So he gives grace. What is grace? It's not mercy. Everybody thinks grace is mercy. They get confused with mercy and grace. They interchange those words, but they're really very vastly different. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, which when you violate and you, and you get let off. It's getting the warning for speeding. <laughs> That's mercy. <laughs> right? Okay, so, so here's the deal. is that you get mercy, but grace is empowering to do what you can't deserve, what you're not worthy of. You're empowered. Those who are weak get empowered to be strong. So it's, it's, it's an empowerment. So he gives, gra- he gives grace to the humble. He gives empowerment. So that's number one. Number two, notice what he says next thing. And therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. Anybody interested in being exalted by God in due time? How many know that's all a good word? In, ex- the word exalt means to be lifted up. It means to be lifted out. In other words, if, if my marriage needs lifting, I need to humble myself under the mighty hand of God that my marriage may be lifted, that my health may be lifted, that my finances, that my, my peace, the peace that I need, it may be, I may be lifted into peace, I may be lifted into whatever God has planned for me. That's a pretty good deal. Notice that, so you get, you get empowerment, you get this uh, exaltation. Number three, he says, casting your care upon, verse number seven says, casting your care upon him for he cares for you. Now, that's a little blind to us because it uses a little de- vernacular. Well, yeah, he cares for you. It, it's what mom does to her, she, she takes care of. In other words, you get the attention of God to take care of you where you can't take care of yourself. You get the attention, you get the touch of God, you get the focus of heaven on your life that he's going to take care of. I got you, I got, I got you, I got, I'm going to take care of you. I got this, I got, I'm going to take care of you. How many like that for 2022? How many like that right now? <laughs> but then notice that number four, he said, then resist the devil. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about by like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, and he'll flee from you. In other words, you're going to have no problem resisting and overcoming your adversary. How many, don't, how, many, how many like some of that? Some, some free flying, some just, you know, some easy, some easy days. Yes, easy days. Come on. Those are the, just that, I, I mean, if those four promises alone yeah. would be worth clothing myself with humility. So true. Well, how, I, believe, I believe, honestly, that this is one of those things, it must be one of those first things that's introduced to new converts. It has to be, because it, it's the earmark of all Christianity. The earmark of Christianity is not how, how many gifts we have, not what denomination we belong to. It has to be humility. Humility is not weakness. Well, I'm going to illustrate. I, I haven't defined it yet for you, but, but, I, 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 but I want to, let's talk about pride first. Let's talk a little bit about pride. Now, watch this. Uh, uh, pride has a, uh, is the opposite effect. If you will, go with me to the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. This is huge, by the way. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2, just the first part of this, the Bible says here, when pride comes, then comes shame. When pride comes, 
Then comes shame. I've had people say, you know, Brother Jeff, I'm ashamed to tell you this. Anytime there's shame in your life, pride preceded that shame. Anything you regret, pride preceded that. Any moment you've had a moment of shame in your life, pride was the father that gave birth to shame. Yeah. That's, that's, this, in other words, pride opens the door for shame to come into your life. Proverbs chapter 13. We're talking about pride a little bit. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 10. I'm going to read this out of the uh, Passion Translation. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. The Bible says that wisdom opens your heart to receive wise counsel. Wisdom opens your heart to receive wise counsel. But pride, notice, listen to this. But pride closes your ears to advice and gives birth only to quarrels and strife. Pride gives birth only to quarrels and strife. So if there's a lot of quarreling going on in your life, pride is somewhere. And pride always says, it's the other person. (laughs) Because pride's always right. And unfortunately, social media has done some wonderful things, but it has also done some very negative things. Social media has given entitlement to every opinion for cowards. Just having an opinion, it never allows empathy. It very seldom ever allows empathy because you may not understand where that person is, but you can just sit up in a high place of critical uh, perception and take pot shots and snipe people's actions, behaviors, thoughts, opinions, and you just can just give them your point of wisdom from your great expansive experience and your great expansive expertise and you can just quarrel with them. How many quarrels have been on social media? How many have you been involved in? Well, you know what, you know what was there first? Pride. Regardless of what side of it, regardless of what side of the argument is, the, more, the, more you, the moment you start quarreling, when, when parents are quarreling with children, there's pride involved. When, when man and wife are uh, quarreling, there's pride somewhere. It's not a word of knowledge. I promised. <laughs> it's getting quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> but anytime you have two parties that are constantly contending and in contention and quarreling, there's pride somewhere. Hadn't got any, got any louder. No amens in here. It's because you're afraid that your f- wife is going to say, don't you say amen. <laughs> Let's go to Proverbs chapter 16. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 18. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. It says, uh, verse 18 says, pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. So pride goes before destruction. Everybody say destruction. Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. Anytime I saw someone's... Now, as a minister, I'm just going to be a little transparent with you. Anytime I see destruction or people's lives being destroyed... Anytime I see uh, their body being destroyed, their relationships being destroyed, their finances being destroyed, anytime I did that, here's what I would do. I would always take the position that because, because my, my initial position, my default position is Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Isaiah 5.13 says, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. So I always have defaulted. Ephesians chapter 4, yes sir, thank you. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 18 says, uh, we are alienated from the life of God through ignorance. 
because of what we don't know. Say, tell somebody, I'm praying for your ignorance. Yeah, well, okay. But now here's the deal. When I see destruction or I see a a person's life being destroyed by something, I think I take the role immediately of they need to be taught. They need to be informed. They need the good news. They need to be given a, a lesson. They need to know what's available to them. As a believer, they need to know what the, the power. But I found that destruction also comes because of pride. Now, guys, you know this as well as I do. You deal differently with someone that doesn't understand differently than you do with someone that's full of pride. You all see this? So if I'm dealing with someone whose life is experiencing destruction or their life is being destroyed, I got to find out, are they ignorant or are they proud or both? I got to find out which one because the, uh, the, the remedy you offer each one of them is different. If they're uninformed, you teach them. But if they are proud, what do you do? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. You could, you could, but if I'm going to help that individual, if I'm going to help that person, what do I have to give the person that's proud? I got I to gotta find some clothes of humility. I got I to gotta offer humility. I got to find a way to engage them to get down out of that pride and to assume a humility. I got to get the clothes of humility around them if I'm going to be able to help them supernaturally. Does this make sense? So I've got to find a way. So guys, if you go into 2022 knowing everything, I, don't ha- I can't help you other than that I'm offering clothes of humility because as long as you know it all, good luck. <laughs> but when you find yourself in destruction, the Bible says here that pride not only opens the door to shame, pride opens the door to quarrel and contention, but it also goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You're setting yourself up to fail and to fall with pride in your life. How many don't want any more pride in your life? <laughs> it's better to raise your hand right there. Just a little help, just a little help. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23. Something interesting here. 29, 23 says, a man's pride will bring him low. So when you put on the clothes of pride, you open the door to shame. You open the door to destruction. You open the door to quarrel. You open the door to fall. And you open the door to being brought low. But it's interesting. You're there in Proverbs chapter 29. Go to Proverbs 22. Y'all okay? Yeah. Proverbs chapter 22. I want, you, uh, I want you to see this. Uh, this, is, this is something amazing. I, when I found this, I thought, oh, how did I miss this? Proverbs chapter 22. Look in here at verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches honor, and life. By humility and the fear of the Lord. Now, I'm not going to teach on the fear of the Lord today because we don't have time. But by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. You want to get healed? By humility and the fear of the Lord. You want to, you want, you want to excel financially? Humility in the fear of the Lord. You want promotion. You want people. Guys, uh, when, I, when I get to the end of my life and they put me, if the Lord tarries and I go by the way of the grave, when they, when they come by my casket, I want, I want my wife to be able to say, he was a great husband. I, I, if, I, if I go by the way of the grave, I want my kids to walk by. Say, he was a great dad. That's important to me. I want my grandchildren to say, he was a great granddad. I don't really care about the public. I really don't care about what everybody thinks. 
But there are some people I really, I want my friend. You know, he was talking about if we go, we got to go together. Well, if I go before him, I want him to say he was a great friend. You know, I've done a couple of, I've done a couple funerals. I've had to do a couple funerals where I was trying to find something to say about this individual that I have to do the funeral for that I don't really know that individual, but I'm, I'm going to go around the family I'm gonna go at, and I, I'm going to try and find out something good to say. I've been in a couple of funerals where there were people that had died. No one had anything good to say about that person. There was no honor. Do you, what that tells me is the person that died lived in pride. Because by humility and the fear of the Lord come riches, honor, and life. So what, have I told you what humility is yet? No. Have I told you what pride is? Not really. I've told you what it does. But uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 18. You, you got a minute for, for me to hang out with you? Have I got your attention enough to you'd hang out and give me another five? Who'll give me five minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20, 20. I, we're going to be here a while. <laughs> Praise God. I got all this offering of time here. Woo, man, I'm good. But notice this Matthew chapter 18. Let's go. I, I, there are several other things here, but I, I'm going to skip to this. Matthew chapter 18. In the New Testament, Jesus, um, verse 1. At, the t- at that time, the disciples came to Jesus, say, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? One of the things I love about this is that Jesus did not skirt this question. He did not, he did not deflect the question. He did not avoid the question. He, the disciples came and said, who is the, who is the greatest? Now, when you put the EST in the English language, there's only that that one place, right? Greatest. You can't have greater and greatest. It's the greatest. Who's, who's the greatest in the kingdom, right? Yeah. So he goes on to say, verse 2, he says this. He said, then Jesus called a child to him. He didn't avoid it. Called a child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as, a, as little children you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom. Notice what Jesus said. They asked him who, but he responds with a whoever. He's saying it's not reserved for one person. He's saying it's reserved for anybody else. They're the greatest in the kingdom. Let me ask you a question. When you get to heaven, who's going to be the greatest one in the kingdom other than God and Jesus? Who's the greatest one? Because here, here, here's the deal, is that when we get to heaven, we're not going to compare resumes. Did you ever think about this? There was a guy that, 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 had, that had gone to heaven and I, I, since, it's, since it's Mobile and you are aware of his grace of joke telling, uh, there was a guy that, was, that went to heaven. And got, when he got to heaven, he said, he, he, he asked the angel, he said, do you all have testimony service around here? He goes, yeah, we do, actually. He said, well, I want to testify of how God saved me out of the Ohio flood. There was never a flood in generations before and generations after like the Ohio flood, a 500-year flood. I mean, it was the biggest thing. There was so much destruction. It was crazy. And I want to testify. I want to testify how God brought me out of the Ohio flood. He said, that'll be fine, but Noah will be in the crowd. How many understand that we're not going to be comparing how many miracles we had in heaven? The language and the fellowship of heaven is love and humility. But Jesus uses an illustration. He said, very interesting. Um, Roman, would you help me? Roman, could you, would you help me? Come here. I'm going to set this chair right over here, and I want you to sit on this chair. Do you mind... How many know Roman? One, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. How many don't know Roman? How many are going to ra- not raise your hand no matter what I ask you? 
I got you. No, he's not my grandson. He's kind of like, a, well, yeah, by adoption. But Jesus, go, when, when Jesus is asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom? He pauses and he goes and gets a child and sets him in the midst of them. And he uses the word, if you humble yourself as this little child. And he uses a child and the word humility to teach adults about greatness. How do you do that? Roman, would you rather be with your mom and dad right now? Or would you rather be sitting here? You'd rather be over there, wouldn't you? Yeah. But you can't go yet. <laughs> just, hang, just hang with Uncle Jeff just for a little while longer. Okay, is that cool? All right. What makes him great is he did what he was asked. How many know Rome? Hey, you don't know his background, do you? So knowing his background, you don't know his accomplishments, do you? I know a couple of people that do. But he, t- he takes a, a child and tells strangers, because he did what was asked of him, he's humbled himself from what he would rather be doing is sitting with mom. Actually, probably be rather in kids' church. But he was asked, I know, I know he was asked to come sit here to help Uncle Jeff. And he'd probably be, rather be back there with his own people. <laughs> hanging out with his own kind, doing what they do. But he came here. And then he's been sitting in the big church, bored. <laughs> and then it came time for him to be called upon, and then he came up and he sat here. And Jesus said, you know what, if you'll do that, that's the ones that are the greatest in the kingdom. In other words, humility doesn't have a better idea of how to spend your time, your energy, your resources than God does. Amen. It doesn't have a better idea. God, I'd rather do this. He said, if you'll just, if you'll just humble yourself, that means retire. Resign, withdraw, yield your way to his way. He said, that's how you get greatness. Roman, thanks for helping me. 20 bucks would be okay? You don't mind hanging out with me now, do you? You want to go sit with my own mom mom, dad again? All right. So, it pays to obey. <laughs> it pays to obey. Now, you realize this, that Jesus was teaching adults to be like a little child. Just do what's asked of you and be obedient and yield and you'll be great in the kingdom. He said, you'll be the greatest in the kingdom. The greatest in the kingdom is the ones that just did what he said to do. You don't have to be responsible for everything. You don't have to, you don't, you, you don't, yeah, you don't have to do everything. You just got to do what he told you. I'll give you this story, then, I, then I'll close. I was pastoring, minding my own business. We were doing really good around Y2K and early 2000s. Doing really well. And the Lord said to us, I want you to resign your church, close the church, and I want you to go back on the, on the road full time, on the field. And I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I loved what I was doing. I loved the people that I was pastoring. I, we, were, we had a pretty good, pretty successful church. We're doing really well, making an impact. I told the Lord, because I'm, I, you know, how many understand that the Lord will, is open to negotiations? Abraham did it. Moses did it. I thought, okay, if they can do it, I can do it. So I started negotiating with the Lord. I said, Lord, I'll go on the road, but I could still pastor. And here's my point, is half of the church that, 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 that that was coming, I had won to the Lord. 
I was hand feeding half of the church and, and they were the ones that were giving me the least amount of trouble. It was the transplants that were giving me trouble. But the ones that I was feeding, I said, Lord, these are my sheep. He goes, no, Jeff, those are my sheep. Yes, sir. I cried for a month because I, 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 I was having to leave some babies behind. I was having to leave some people that I cherish behind. The, the grace that was coming on me. Now, I've, I've see, we've seen probably two, 300,000 people come to the Lord since that time. So now instead of having that church of that number of people, we've actually added, because I, asked, I did what he said to do, we've added 250, 300,000 people to the kingdom of God in the last 20 years. How many know that's not, that's not, a, bad, that's not a bad accomplishment? Yeah. How many know God's not going to be upset if you show up with 300,000 extra people? Amen. But the deal is, is that if I went out and got those 300,000 people and, and won those because I wanted to, and not because I was asked to, that could be wasted energy. Because unless the Lord builds the house, they that build it labor in vain. So humility is, Lord, not my will. Not my argument. Not my point. I was arguing with my wife one time. I know it's, I know it's a shock. <laughs> and we were, we were, have, we call them discussions. Sometimes the neighbors can hear our discussions, but no, we don't get that crazy. But uh, I'm, uh, she's going into the bedroom and I thought I just announced, well, you just don't care. The Lord got involved in that argument because I've always told the Lord, you have an inv open invitation to say anything you want to at any time you want to, whatever you want, speak on whatever opportunity, on whatever topic. And the Lord says, that's none of your business. How come when we want to prove a point, when we're talking talk about submission, we always get the opposite party's scriptures prepared? Husbands go to the wife's scripture. See, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Wives go to the husband's scripture. This is what you're supposed to be doing. How about we just go to our own scriptures and humble ourselves away from our point and say, you know what? You win. I'm, I'm going to yield. I'm going to resign. I'm going to retire. Because I want riches and honor in life. I want the blessing to be upon marriage. I want, I want a blessing to be upon our family. I want a blessing to be upon our business, upon the place where I work. Guys, you can, you can be proud in another area and be humble in other areas. And God is saying in 2022, it's going to require that we strip ourselves of every one of our ideas and adopt his ideas. That we're going to have to strip ourselves of us being right and allow him to be right and him do the fighting for us. And I want you to take an examination of your own life. I don't want you to examine anyone else other than your own life. Is there an area where you've been finding destruction, where you've been finding limited success that maybe you can address and, say, and, and take a good look in the mirror and say, maybe, maybe it's because I'm promoting this idea that I have or this conviction that I have rather than saying, Lord, fight for me. Fight my battles for me. Do the work for me so that I just walk it out what you lead, where you lead. I want you to take a, a, an examination of yourself. Is there an area that you can say, I need to put on the clothes of humility so that he may give me grace, that he might exalt me in due time, that he might take care of me, that he might fight my adversary for me. If that's you today, that's what we want. We want you to not make a resolution 
just in the sense of just a wish, but make, it, make a quality decision for which there is a clear course of action, from which there is no retreat. I'm going to be a person of humility. I'm going to be what God says I can be. I'm going to do what God says I can do, and I'm going to speak what God says to speak. Would you close your eyes all over this building? I want to pray for you. You know, you can't even come into this kingdom until you submit yourself and say, God, I, I, it was my sin. Father, I thank you for those that are, have a listening ear. I thank you for those that, have, are, that are hearing me this morning, for those that, are, that, that, that have a listening ear, that have a heart to do what you want them to do. Lord, this word is a word that helps strengthen our faith, strengthen our love, strengthen our authority, strengthen our peace, strengthen your anointing on our lives. And Father, I pray for them that they would be clothed with humility, spirit, soul, body, financially, relationally, so that their destinies can unfold in front of them rather than having to be worked out. And Lord, I praise you and I thank you. I give you the glory and the honor for that in Jesus' name. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life and you'd like to make him the Lord of your life, you want to humble yourself, would you just lift your hand and say, you know, I'd like to pray that prayer. I'd like to accept Jesus as my Savior and Lord. If that's you, yes, thank you. Anyone else? You want to like to join these that are raising their hands? Hallelujah. Make that quality decision today to say, you know what, I'm going to strip myself of pride. But if you're here today and you want to receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, here's how you do it. Say, dear Jesus, I believe that you are God's only son. That God raised you on the third day. I accept you to forgive me of all of my sin. Be my Savior. Be my master. Be my Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you made that prayer, you're welcome to the kingdom of heaven. You got to, you're in. Now put on those clothes of humility and walk out your destiny. God bless you. Pastor.